Okay. Happy birthday, Sherry. Welcome, everyone. We're uh, once again virtual. I'm very pleased to see so many faces that are familiar to us, including our supporters, our donors, families, and staff from Capital Care are online today. So we're just happy to see everyone. So welcome to the Ambassadors uh, Gathering. I'm, I've given up calling it a luncheon because we, uh, we can't gather together yet, but we're getting there one year soon. Um, before we start, I just wanna ask that you all mute your mics for the duration of the hour. And I recommend you choose the speaker view if you can, if you can, just makes a nicer experience for yourself. And we're, um, during the morning, uh, I'll be, or over the lunch hour, I guess, we uh, will do a little bit of talking, but mostly I'm going to be introducing our guest speaker today, and he's going to uh, be sharing a lot of great thoughts with you. Afterwards, there'll be time for some Q&A. And I will ask that you put your questions into the chat room if you type them in there. And uh, we'll bring them forward in a moderated format after his, uh, his talk. So, you know, one of the great things about foundations, especially in healthcare, is that we can focus on change for the betterment of the patients and the residents we serve. With the community support um, that you provide, we can help bring in new and leading edge transformations to support healing and wellness. And we, we really can be change agents, which is a really exciting part of foundations. This is what our foundation is focused on. And we have a new building being built that is going to provide programs that are focused on bettering the services for our seniors that provide leading edge rehab so seniors can go back to home rather than straight to long-term care. And for those that need to stay, the excellent services and excellence um, in the care that they need making sure that the equipment is there that is the top notch for them. Um, it will also ensure that we provide excellence in training for those professionals and practitioners who really wanna specialize in senior and dementia care. This is forward thinking at its best and we wanna support that. In addition, this foundation is focused on bringing in the improvements needed to bring our virtual visitation into this century. This past year, the need was like no other and you guys all know this, and our systems were just not where they needed to be. Families and residents were frustrated and our staff wanted to do all they could, but the system for virtual connections was just not there. So we're raising funds to make those improvements in our older centers so that we can provide optimal tech support for visitation, not only in a pandemic, but to help families stay connected every day, families who live at a distance or who snowbird, grandchildren who go to, away to college or want to share their, their uh, great-grandchildren's stories and let them see, meet and talk to their grandparents and great-grandparents. These are the things that are so important. We want to see that happen at our centers. We're pleased to share that we are moving forward with a trial of improved Wi-Fi at our veteran center first and then rolling it out to the others as the funding comes in. We are committed to keeping families connected. Now, before we get to the main presentation today, I just want to take a moment to share with you a short video clip that really tells a poignant story of why and how creative thinking and bettering tech can make a difference in our centers. Take a watch. The pandemic has really forced people to stay apart and connect differently. Nowhere has it been more critical than at the long-term care centers, especially if they experienced an outbreak, sometimes lasting months. Families wanted to see their loved ones and residents wanted to see their families. There were so many stories of virtual gatherings, celebrations, and moments of compassion when it came to keeping people connected. One such story has truly hit home and we wanna share that with you today. Tad was a longtime resident at Capital Care Linwood and Aggie, his daughter, spent many hours visiting her dad, as did her mom. Tad had dementia and it was progressing. This meant he was more and more dependent on the supports of others. When Aggie went to visit, she would read aloud to him or listen to music. Meaningful memories and moments that mattered made each visit important. COVID meant so many restrictions and more so for those living in long-term care. The fear of either getting COVID or being part of the spread was something that agonized Aggie as she tried to find a way to better stay engaged with her dad. Then there was the PPE. 
how could he possibly understand her reading or singing through a mask? She really felt she needed a new approach once an outbreak took over at the center. And there it was, the recreation team offered virtual visits. She knew she had to jump on that. They were short due to so few data-powered tablets, but something was better than nothing. Eggie booked for herself and her mom as often as possible. It allowed them to spend time with him without the limitations that masking and PPE created. It worked great under the circumstances and provided her and her mom time with him that was so precious. Then the day came when they heard he now had COVID. Conflicting thoughts of exposure for her mom and being there for her dad ran through her head. So she bought a laptop and an internet hotspot. The building's Wi-Fi connection was not strong enough to reach the resident rooms, so Aggie set up a virtual connection via the laptop directly at Tad's bedside. Aggie worked with the staff and set up regular evening Zoom. As COVID took hold of Tad, their worst fear came. He was now at end of life. As hard as it was to not be there, Aggie and her mom both felt they stayed connected virtually in a way that made the journey through the end of life meaningful for Tad. 60 plus years they were married and not being together at this time was so hard but their decision to keep all safe and connect virtually was a relief in so many ways the hardest moment was when aggie just knew he was leaving them after her mom said her last goodbyes aggie told her dad she loved him then closed down the zoom call within the hour they got a call tad had passed away in the days that followed, Aggie reflected on the whole experience. She really hopes we can all help capital care centers gain improved Wi-Fi. Maybe we won't be in a pandemic, but for those families who travel or live far away, or for those whose situations mean they just can't be there every day, connecting virtually is the way to go. I want to take a moment to thank our family member, Aggie, for sharing this truly heartfelt story. It really speaks to the importance of ensuring the best connectivity we can do. And now I am so pleased to introduce our special guest today, Mr. John McDougall, the president of Dalcor, Dalcor Innoventions uh, Limited. As a fourth generation Edmontonian, John has spent 18 years as president of the Al Alberta and National Research Councils, and with 30 years in the industry was Chair of APEGA and Engineers Canada, the Edmonton Chamber of Commerce, and many other social and not-for-profit organizations. He has now returned to the private sector, where he is CEO of Bioconversion Data Bank Foundation, a synthetic biology not-for-profit. He has served at the local, provincial, and federal and international level on numerous agencies and advisory committees related to trade, education, innovation, engineering, economic development, and employment. John has shared of his time with Capital Care Foundation to help on two very important campaigns. First with the Kipnis Center for Veterans campaign, seeing the new building open in 2005, and most recently with the Stepping Up Norwood campaign, joining uh, many of uh, many friends that we have on there um, and seeing things underway. His forward thinking for what seniors care could look like has been instrumental in how we look at the possibilities that lie ahead for this incredible new center named the Jean Swazdesky Center at Norwood. Today, he's here to share some of those future forward thoughts on what we can expect and should expect for best care for, of our seniors as we move forward in the next decade. So with no further ado, here is John McDougall to share his presentation, What's Ahead for Healthcare, Innovation and Efficiencies for an Aging Population. Oops, uh, I need to have screen sharing enabled, please, and then we can get underway. One more time, I'll have to ask that the host enable participant screen sharing so that I can make a presentation. There we go.
Well, thanks very much, Sherry. That was uh, <laughs> much more of an introduction than I would ever have expected, but uh, it's very kind. Uh, what I, I thought I would do is uh, quickly start, if we can make this work now. Now it's not moving ahead, just hang on. We'll continue to keep playing, try one more time. There we go. Okay. Um, and, uh, Terry was kind enough to uh, quickly mention this bioconversion data bank foundation that we're involved with. And it is in some ways connected to what we're talking about today because we're using genetics and synthetic biology to, uh, along with artificial intelligence and machine learning, essentially to make uh, a Lego box of biological solutions that we can apply to different problems, including health and do it much faster and much more quickly. And as you'll see, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning and data in general are really the essence of the future. And even in that very poignant video that you showed uh, clearly is a reflection of the kinds of things that we have to be able to do going forward. Now, why does this keep freezing up? It's just slow, I guess. Health involves a lot of challenges. And uh, this slide that I borrowed from the University of Calgary Biomedical Program uh, gives you an example of many of them. Uh, if you look at the uh, items on the right, you'll realize that many of the issues are age related. Uh, but also, uh, many of the solutions uh, that need to be applied are multidisciplinary. And as we start to look at at health in a broader sense, we find that healthcare takes many forms. And so the capabilities that we require do so as well. Uh, so what we're really looking at today is uh, ultimately how all of this relates to where health innovation is occurring and in particular, how it's changing the way in which the aged uh, work through some of the latter parts of their life. Now, let me make one clarification though, and that is that uh, we're talking about innovation and many people get confused about invention as being innovation. Innovation really is a newer, better way of doing things that are valued, but it's even more than that. It's actually making sure that they are put in use. Whereas an invention is simply uh, demonstrates the fact that you can do something. So innovation really means putting things to use to add value for people. And in the case of health, that means making their uh, lives better, safer, longer, et cetera. Now, what's been driving health? Uh, the human population passed the 1 billion mark early in the 1800s. We're now up to about 7.7 .7 billion, uh, growth driven primarily by two things, infant mortality on the one hand and longer average lives on the other. Uh, both were enabled by innovations, uh, better sanitation, uh, safe, secure food and water, and of course, things like vaccination, which we're very uh, aware of today. Uh, more recently, the last 50 to 60 years, uh, innovation focused primarily on contagious diseases and workplace. Uh, but more recently, we're seeing massive improvements in cardiovascular, diabetes, and arthritis. Uh, and, uh, and as we grow and, and live longer, the age-related issues like cancer, dementia, chronic disease, and long-term care are now major drivers, especially of healthcare demands and costs. And for many consumers though, except in the extreme and emergency cases, because of these increasing demands, their perception is often that the healthcare experience itself is actually declining. Now we are struggling, of course, with cost. Cost is something you can't ignore in health, and uh, and certainly the trends don't suggest there's much hope for relief. Pre-COVID, uh, Canadian governments were spending forty-six hundred dollars per person on healthcare, which was about seven and a half percent of GDP. 
Uh, Conference Board of Canada has estimated that healthcare expenditures are going to continue to grow at about 5.4% per annum, roughly half due to inflation. Uh, so we'll just assume that that doesn't really change the balance between the ins and outs of the health funders. So it's really population growth, uh, aging, and uh, system improvement where the uh, increased costs are coming from. But left on the current path of doing things much the same way and assuming that the economy stays more or less as it is, uh, government spending on health would rise to over $7,000 per person, which would be 11.4% of GDP, all other things being equal. So clearly innovation is desperately needed if we're going to change things. Now, it's a, a big issue, of course. Health, tech, health innovation is complex, and I don't expect you to look through this chart and, and dig all kinds of things out of it, but fundamentally, uh, you know, we live with knowledge and technology that we can work with, and we look at demands that we're trying to apply it to, which is the upper part of the graph. Ultimately, we're trying to slow down the rate of, of expenditure uh, while our population is aging, and we want to do that ideally by improving their life at the same time, which pushes us not just into healthcare, but also to thinking about the whole issue of assisted autonomous living. Now, most of us on the healthcare side have experienced drugs and imaging and, and so on and all that kind of thing. So we have a pretty good idea about how those work. Uh, but what we may not be quite as aware of is uh, the capabilities that are that are showing up in health. And these uh, capabilities, the percentages that are being shown are the degree of intensity of use, if you like. So uh, 30 in the case, just for example, of the top one, uh, high use, 39% uh, of them are used highly, 76% used to some degree. Uh, so you get a sense of what's coming in and being applied into the healthcare system. Uh, what uh, sort of jumps out is that they're all pretty much based on information technology and uh, data in one way or another. We see doctors and medical professionals using many portable devices. We're seeing sensors built into everything from clothing to watches and even tattoos as shown here. These devices can then all be interconnected. And then when we add artificial intelligence, we presumably are able to obtain significant improvements in detection and diagnosis. We can make body parts now through what's called 3D printing, which again is governed by uh, IT technology. So far it's relatively simple things like perhaps veins or whatever, but they're steadily increasing to more complex ones. Robots are starting to encroach into uh, healthcare uh, to uh, facilitate and enhance some nursing activities. Uh, but they're steadily advancing into more and more complex areas uh, as patient companions, as remote interrogators, and so on. And we can now use, as was pointed out in the uh, video that you showed, we can use visual reality or augmented reality for a host of, of applications, not just interaction with patients, but for training, simulation, and diagnosis. Uh, we can help use it to relax patients and speed up their recovery. And, uh, and we have amazing simulators which allow surgeons to practice their skills. For example, one uh, that we developed in uh, an NRC while I was there is for brain surgery, and it allows a brain surgeon to actually get the completely tactile experience of, of an actual surgery without actually doing it. So they can practice spe specifically where things are very sensitive within the brain. So IT then underpins most of today's uh, technologies. They're, uh, they're sensors, they're gathering devices, they're sharing devices, and they're processing devices. Lots and lots of data is generated and gathered from equipment and cell phones and laptops and cameras. And to use all this data, we're starting to bring together 
artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is uh, enhanced and facilitated by the increasing power and improving algorithms that we're able to bring to bear. I, sketch, I skipped over genomics, uh, but genomics is biology, but biology is also really these days more and more reliant on bioinformatics because it's so data intense and uh, because the complexity is, is so high. We've got the ability to sequence DNA and do it rapidly now, and we can start to look more holistically at individuals, but also what they call metagenomics, where we actually combine the biological environment in which they live. Now, what's interesting about that, of course, is that much of this data is not static. Um, a cell can make thousands of copies of DNA and uh, in a, in a new form, or they can make RNA, which is a placeholder for making proteins. And the RNA can make copies of itself or other things multiple times. And this is going on millions of, uh, in millions of cells in our body all the time. We've got the free riders in the gut and elsewhere that aren't part of our actual individual self, but clearly are interacting with our genome and the work it does on a continuing basis. So it's a hugely complicated area facilitated only by IT. Now we hear lots about personalized medicine and the ability to sequence this means presumably it should be easy. Uh, this is sometimes called precision medicine because we can target things very explicitly uh, based on an individual specific DNA structure. Uh, and it is becoming more common primarily in cancer and for rare genetic conditions. But I would say so far, we've just barely touched the tip of the iceberg because again, of the incredible complexity of the problem. Each of the seven and a half billion people in the world have a unique double strand molecule called DNA that's made up of 3.2 billion pairs of A, C, G, and T. Now, anyone who's signed on to one of these uh, uh, family tree type uh, situations, uh, you know, gets information back on maybe a few hundred. Um, and so really uh, don't have any ability to gain a huge amount of value from it, except by the odd coincidence. But this is a reality. If you really want to work at personalized medicine, you have to work at this level. But then within the DNA, you've got uh, three base sequences, so of these 3.2 billion pairs that are called genes, about 30,000 genes have been identified. And then, as I mentioned, there's all the other organisms that, we've uh, that we're interacting with. So it's a hugely complex problem. But what's fascinating is the pieces are now coming into place to make it possible. Um, so while personalized medicine has until now been easier to talk about than to actually achieve, now with biological tools like CRISPR, which is a cut and snip and paste type technology, combined with digital tools, the artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera, um, we can actually do things. And this is the kind of thing we're playing with in this Bioconversion Data Bank Foundation. It lets us use machines to accomplish tasks that would have required huge amounts of human involvement in the past, if we could do them at all. And it can do those tasks much faster. It allows us to work with larger volumes of data more quickly and things are progressing incredibly fast. And just as an example, again, from, from the Bioconversion Foundation, a job that just a few weeks ago took us weeks of preparation and 30 hours of computer time. And as I say, just a couple of weeks ago, now takes us about an hour. So it's absolutely remarkable the pace at which this is moving. So we can use machines now with machine learning algorithms to find patterns in these massive data sets. And we can use those patterns to explore and find meaning in other data sets. And with those patterns, we can identify and discover underlying causes and then build models that ultimately predict outcomes on still other data sets. So this starts to really become or make, if you like, machine learning and artificial intelligence a reality in ways that we've all been 
sort of imagining in the science fiction, but is now becoming real. Now, with, what that means is we can go all the way to, uh, to synthetic biology where we actually engineer living cells. So not just work with existing living cells, but actually engineer uh, the DNA and build it up from scratch to do something useful. And that may be sensing a toxic compound. It might be treating a disease. It might be producing an organically based product. Who knows? <clears throat> But what happens when we look a little further ahead? Um, we now start to uh, get some additional insights. I'm uh, again borrowing from The Economist, which uh, uh, has put out a very interesting article in this area. But what's again most obvious is the continuing importance of integrating digital and genetic technologies. So telemedicine is, is uh, right at the top of their list. Um, that means remote diagnosis, means potentially intelligence machines and robotics that uh, would supplement or replace the need for face-to-face -face interaction with a health professional. Now, if you can do that, then hospitals could conceivably become smaller because more diagnosis and treatment would be done remotely. Time and hospitalization when it occurs would be reduced by facilities like Norwood, which facilitate return to home. Precision medicine will integrate the environmental and lifestyle information of people, which it might capture through continuous monitoring of their activities along with their genetic makeup. And that hopefully would lead to prevention and more timely treatment which would also reduce demand and cost for care conceivably. Devices that are placed in and uh, moved around the body will become common. Uh, nanobots, for example, would search out diseased cells, deliver pharmaceuticals, maybe even destroy diseased cells without pharmaceuticals, little micro lasers or something. Now that would avoid antimicrobial resistance issues and would minimize the potential for allergic reactions. And it's fascinating, a technique already exists for early cancer diagnosis where a robotically steered transducer can be guided to a specific site within the body by an MRI ultrasound combination where it can then scan a target and produce a 3D image so the surgeon can tell where to the ideal spot, if you like, to take the sample for the biopsy. Now, in-body sensors uh, may routinely explore monetary circular health, circulatory health, um, might provide guidance to nanobots on where to clean out portions of our circulatory system. Uh, smart dust, which really is arrays of tiny computers with, it, with antennas that are smaller than a grain of sand might be able to organize themselves in the body to attack a range of processes, you know, like swarms attacking early stage cancer or taking relief, uh, pain relief to a wound or maybe ferreting out viruses. And by this time, we'll probably be able to print on a 3D basis completely new organisms. Um, we may be able to treat aging so we'll no longer even grow older, God forbid. And our brains might be enhanced by real-time connections to AI and big data analytics. So the big question that emerges actually is assuming these things are going to be able to do, be done, pardon me, and it probably they are, for lesser developed regions of the world, the question is whether they'll have access to these technologies, but for advanced parts of the world like us, the issues are mostly around ethics and privacy. Uh, you know, do we want our genome to be fully analyzed and widely available? Do we want to produce designer babies? Do we, are we willing to stop aging? Uh, would we let machines make their decisions independently especially when there's some kind of inherent bias in them just because whoever develops them inevitably has certain biases. Well, 
Sherry uh, reminds me that, you know, the real need in care is the right care at the right time and the right place. And if we think about starting with the right place, you know, care can occur at home. It can occur in the home of a family member. It can occur in an assisted living residence, long-term care facility, hospital, hospice. I think in general, people prefer non-institutional care if they can achieve it, uh, which means at home or in an independent living environment of some kind, or in some cultures, maybe it's the extended family. Determining which option is viable though depends on what the right care entails, uh, whether it's due to physical or mental uh, conditions or chronic conditions, or whether it's a follow on to a medical or surgical procedure, whether it's rehabilitation or palliative care. And it also depends though on the availability and, of, and capability of caregivers. So the individual may be part of that, family members, friends, volunteers, neighbors, et cetera. Now, as people live longer, chronic disease is now one of the biggest issues. 80% of people over 65 have at least one chronic condition and two thirds have two or more. Some are quite debilitating, some not so much. But again, people generally prefer to stay home as long as they can safely do so. Now, I was attracted to the Norwood campaign because it doesn't presume those who enter an institution should become patients for life. The need for ongoing care doesn't necessarily go away, but the goal is to return patients to a level of functionality where they can return home, continue to live in their community, obtain the care and assistance they need and retain a high degree of independence. So everyday requirements though are very wide ranging. They range from personal hygiene, it's nutrition, housekeeping challenges, companionship, recreation, exercise, entertainment, counseling, you know, financial affairs, medication, therapy, you know, they all become more difficult for a person with medical, mental, physical, or, or medical issues. But monitoring and control technologies are increasingly available. And uh, they're in smart homes, and they're certainly in institutions as well. But in the home, private service providers are offering technologies to keep people safe and comfortable, to monitor their activities, and even to engage socially. Cameras linked to the internet, as we saw in the little video, allow family, family members or others to see and track what's going on, who's coming in or out of a home, for example, to monitor what happens when a visitor is inside. Uh, monitoring systems can now be controlled by the senior through a smart speaker like Amazon's Alexa or through their smartphone or tablet. So they can control access to their home without necessarily having to get up or get out of bed. Within a residence, we can track how long and what for uh, with appliances. Uh, soon we'll be able to track the food in the fridge and manage it. Smart stoves, smart faucets, assist seniors, even the ones with memory loss to go about their days with fewer potential pitfalls for burns or fires or floods. Uh, smart thermostats, learn behavior patterns, keep the home comfortable, manage costs at the same time. Sensors can gauge the air quality and determine when something's gone wrong. Uh, maybe even that personal hygiene is being ignored. So there's loads and loads of data that can be picked up and gathered. Um, interesting falls are a common reason for a senior to be admitted to the hospital. But machine learning actually can help identify the potential for falls and mitigate fall risks just by observing and monitoring how people are moving around the, the potential for falling. Motion sensors can detect when a fall does occur and send out an alarm. Um, a lot of falls for seniors happen in the night when visibility is poor. So simple motion-based lighting can deal with that. So without a doubt in my mind, the future of care, whether it's at home or in an institution, 
is going to be shaped by Internet of Things technology. And that means all the devices and infrastructure are able to communicate with each other and their status and activity can be integrated with remote patient monitoring. And then the combined data processed through AI and ML for predictive analytics so that alarms or other actions can be taken um, in a timely way. So as we mentioned earlier, you know, continuous monitoring of personal health indicators and vital signs can be built into wearables. Smart medication management systems can avoid improper doses of drugs or identify the need for change. And of course, remind people when they should take them in the first place. Smart watches can track diabetes. Smart socks can monitor skin temperature. Smart vests can, can, can assist in breathing. Heart rate monitors can alert emergency responders at the first sign of trouble. So intelligent platforms then that bring all this together can assist in decision support and help recognize acute conditions that might otherwise go unnoticed. And when linked with AI, the integrated data from all these sensors is of great value for early detection. So medical issues from heart murmurs to anxiety can now be monitored uh, by, by combining implants and nanobots and linking them through, say, smartphone monitoring. A uh, bionic pancreas that's being tested at Boston University has a little sensor on an implantable needle that monitors blood sugar levels for diabetics and then reports to a smartphone. A British research team, really intriguing piece of work is developing cyber pills with microprocesses in them that can text the doctors directly from inside your body. The pills help doctors know if you're taking your medication properly and if it's having the desired effect. Then to power these implantables, teams are working on biodegradable batteries that generate power inside the body and transfer it wirelessly to where it's needed and then they simply melt away. Another project is looking at uh, how to use the body's own glucose to generate power for these implants. Now we've talked about telemedicine before, but telemedicine technologies facilitate the remote exchange of information, basically. Um, they're often via virtual mediums and usually between a patient and their physician, but perhaps by intermediaries. You know, appointments can be held by phone using or a video call through an app, or you could use a telemedicine robot. Um, and these would all help seniors reduce travel time, transportation costs, and the number of visits they need to make to the professional health clinics or hospital. You know, when we start to look at robotics, it's a cute little Japanese one, which is uh, helping to move people around. Um, Robotic technology continues to evolve very rapidly. Medical robots offer really robust functionality and they can answer patients' medical questions now, even semantic ones. They can manage their medications and they can connect them with appropriate healthcare professionals when needed. And they can provide, uh, I would say provider tasks such as lifting and ambulatory assistance as shown here. And some can now learn and adapt to the individual based on the patient or individual behavior. So virtual home assistants are now emerging. Conversational robots can provide conversations that are tailored to some degree to the individual person. They can even ferret out hard to get information about an individual's treatment needs as they become uh, comfortable with each other. This Japanese robot can lift elderly people. Another uh, provides daily reminders of routine, can play games, answer questions, keep older, act, older adults active and engaged and connect them to their family and the outside world. And I think the, the key here is uh, best demonstrated by a little video I'll show you. I'll introduce you to Pepper. 
Uh, and if I can just stop sharing and ask the uh, other end here to queue up. Pepper. Oh, my Lord. What? What's that? Hello, my name is Pepper. I'm here at your service. Are you? Well, do you know Dr. Mitchell, my doctor? Dr. Robert Mitchell? Would you like me to book an appointment for you? Well, that would be brilliant. Um, I am Rebecca Parker. He is available at 11.30. That would be perfect. It's just before lunch. Yay! Appointment confirmed. Don't forget to do your daily exercises. <laughs> Peppa. It seems I have a new friend. As it turned out, uh, production of pepper was ultimately suspended due to lack of demand, but I think that's because to some degree it was just slightly ahead of its time. But clearly the world of healthcare for the aged is changing. Uh, robotics, intelligence systems, internet of things, in body tools and so on are all making it possible to extend and actually enhance the period of independent living. And these capabilities mean that patient-centered care can actually be provided independent of where a person lives to a large degree. Uh, technology extends the reach of healthcare providers, it provides physical assistance, it can administer medications, offer companionship, monitor daily living, protect people from themselves, and reach out in a timely way when help is needed. So I think we can say that the world for the aged is truly an exciting one, and it's going to be enabled by some truly remarkable technological and innovation advances. So thanks for your attention. John, thank you for helping us see the possibilities. I, um, I am really, you know, there are some things there I had no idea about, and I'm sure others are the same. And so I'd like to just open it up for, for some Q&A if people have some questions. Um, I know, just put them in the chat. I do have, um, a, you know, I, I'm amazed about the nanobots, and I just was wondering if you see the elimination of cancer once the nanobot tech gets well underway. Is that like something we can see in the near future? I think you can see um, certainly nanobots that will be able to address cancer in ways we've never dreamed of before and certainly potentially eliminating these really heavy, uh, high impact treatments that we have today that are so hard on the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the real challenge in cancer is the uh, early detection. And, um, and that's where I think these uh, advances in, in genetics and artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the ability to work with genomes, hopefully will accelerate that and be able to pick things up in a much earlier way, just based on, on uh, much smaller levels of uh, development of the cancer itself. Hmm. Boy, that should be a relief for a lot of people. Um, do you see the robo nurse being the future of home care? Like I, I just think about um, the restorative care program that we have at Norwood and we have started to see it spread uh, throughout the province, but um, restorative care with the idea of people going home once they've um, had some rehab time, but we know that they need some increased support is, do you think the robo nurse will be one of those things that will end up in homes versus just in facility settings? I think we'll see both, like most things, you know, the uh, institutions will probably uh, be able to have them first. Is, uh, in the short term, it'll be affordability problems. And I think that's really what cost Pepper uh, its uh, development, that the institutions hadn't yet reached the stage where they really knew how to use them and the people couldn't afford them. So the the two have to kind of come together, but that's where progress is moving so quickly is to make them much, much cheaper. Um, you know, I've been around a long time and my dad used to love technology and I can still remember one Christmas where he 
had a very early robot, which just blew all the grandkids away it was <laughs> because it was very early stage, but it couldn't do much, right? But now um, these uh, entities, as long as the topic area is reasonably confined and they uh, sort of understand the milieu in which they're working, the, the ability to, uh, to work with semantic discussions rather than just matching up words makes them so much more powerful and and i will say more human-like they'll never be human but more human-like and easier for people to relate to and get their heads around hmm. it's amazing especially when we see the the resource shortages we're experiencing through the pandemic um i see um uh, neil has asked a question in what area do you see the largest cost savings occurring well i think inevitably the the I'll give you a bit of a preamble on that. The, uh, when I talked about the cost, what I didn't mention was that the uh, so-called improvements in, in, uh, in access to health systems are considered to be one of the major drivers of cost increases rather than innovation being a driver of cost reduction. And I think that's because what's happening is we take on more and more ways of being able to provide care so there um, and we keep adding to the cost structure so the challenge is to to gain uh, cost efficiencies we actually have to make changes in the way we do things and i think that's again where the norwood model becomes so interesting institutional care is very very expensive um, and the, the more we can in fact help people move away from that and make the institution only episodic as opposed to a continuing event, the more likely we probably are to contain costs, I think. If, uh, certainly those that are age-driven. Uh, personalized medicine is a different question. Personalized medicine, uh, we can already see, uh, you know, can be an incredibly expensive uh, way to go because what you're doing then is more and more a one-off that is limited to one person. And if those are, are one-off interventions that are highly expensive, then you've got serious problems on the cost side. So it's a, it's a tricky balance there, I think. Hmm. Um, okay, there are a lot of questions coming forward. So one question is what hurdles exist to get some of the smart home technology into the homes of seniors? Um, well, obviously, um, one challenge seniors have, especially if, they, if they've stayed in their home for a long, long time, is their homes are outdated. Um, and uh, it's just like we're talking about with Norwood. If you don't have the capacity mm -hmm. to be able to, uh, to use them, and that's the ability to, in some cases, it's the uh, communications technologies and, and so on available. Um, then they can't use them anyway. Uh, so that's an issue, but that's coming with 5G technology anyway. The Internet of Things is going to move us in those directions. So I think it's the big hurdle um, is going to be that they will cost money. People have to be able to invest in them and they uh, funding models are going to be probably of, of great interest in terms of figuring them out because part of it is uh, deciding what is a burden that the public at large carries and what's the burden that the individual carries. And mm -hmm. in this business where we're kind of in the gray space between home and institution, um, it's, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, there's another question here from Thomas. Is the nanobot used for treatment for blood clots? I don't know whether it is. I honestly can't answer that question. Um, I would say that it certainly, in theory, probably could be. But I can't answer that question. I don't know. Okay. Um, Michelle has asked, in which of these areas are Canadian institutions and companies leading in? Um, Canada is doing quite well in, in genetics and um, artificial intelligence and machine learning. 
we are not so good in producing the end products, but in terms of the science and technology going into them, we're, uh, we're doing pretty well. Um, I would say when you start looking in the smart homes, um, there is a lot of that going on. It is global uh, because those things are, and, uh, and we're mostly buyers, unfortunately, although um, I would say our building codes are starting to move in these directions. So that's a plus. Um, but Canada's greatest challenge in innovation is that we do a much better job coming up with ideas than we do with commercializing. Yeah, um, uh, this is two questions kind of combined. Um, technology is a bit daunting for seniors at, at times. And I, I know that the pandemic has certainly um, helped um, decrease that, um, that challenge, but um, it seems that there would be a need for higher education or more focus on education and supports. Um, and what, um, as far as tech, tech literacy, how can we help our seniors become more technical, especially with smart homes and these devices that would be in the homes? Well, a lot of them, you can uh, make them more and more remote. So you could actually extend probably the one way is to extend um, monitoring and oversight to third parties that are not necessarily in the home. That's where these, okay. um, some of these service providers come to bear and, and do some of those things. Um, clearly, I mean, we all uh, become nerds pretty quickly, you know, when it comes to IT and uh, we sort of, in my case, you know, you look to the kids or the grandkids to help you out. Um, and um, so part of it is just openness. Um, you know, increasingly more and more people obviously have grown up to some degree with this uh, IT. So the, uh, it's not like starting cold. Um, and the, the individual elements have more and more smarts built into them and more and more sensors built into them so they can be helpful as well. So you can get to the point where if you can get, if you can turn on a switch, you can make them work because it's, uh, voice interaction and it's a more normal type of conversation uh, experience. I know that um, during the pandemic, our day programs here were experiencing, they were trying to work with the clients who lived at home and um, and having to teach them remotely on how to use the computers. It was quite quite an experience for our yeah. staff. So yeah. um, I know that it's not easy, but I think there's, it's possible. I guess that's the piece for me is that it's possible. That, that's correct. But, it, but remember what we're doing also, all of us went in with, um, without really the uh, total volume of, of capabilities that we need to be virtual. Uh, mm -hmm. We were very fortunate. There were lots of things in place that we could build on, but most of us hadn't been users. Um, so suddenly, uh, things like this that we're doing now with with uh, Zoom on this uh, interaction, for example, um, two years ago you wouldn't even have thought of doing it this way, um, and yeah. most of the people attending probably wouldn't have ever thought of connecting up to something like this. Uh, you know, webinars existed, but they were not as anything like as pervasive as they are today. So, you know, the situation creates part of the pull. And uh, with the pull that we've had, makes these transitions probably uh, simpler going forward. Mm -hmm. So what would you, what advice would you give to someone who is a senior in preparing themselves for the technological innovations that, so that they can stay independence as long as possible? That's a good question. I'm a senior, so I'll say, how do I prepare myself? Um, you know, I'm a curious person, so that helps. Um, I uh, like new things, so that helps. Um, I've had enough uh, interaction with things, but these days, if you've interacted with your TV and the controls and whatever, you can probably almost do anything you want anywhere else. It's, it, it gets easier and easier, but, you know, um, what I think is, you know, we have, over time, we have uh, little not-for-profits that set up to uh, 
provide various kinds of things. I think historically, you know, you had uh, uh, Victoria Order of Nurses, you've got St. John Ambulance, you've got different groups that do different things. And it may well be that the uh, seniors organizations uh, should be taking on elements like this to uh, provide training and whatever in senior centers and stuff like that. I think it would be very helpful. Well, I know that we have a group of uh, students from Grant McEwen on the call today, and that, so maybe they will come up with some great ways to do some education for seniors. Um, I think the key is the outreach. You know, um, people have to know uh, that something good is available and how to get at it. And so awareness is a big, big piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think there, there's so much opportunity here for us to um, learn and grow. Um, both in facility living and home care, it's it's there's a lot of exciting things here and things that I was not aware of until you and I started talking. So I'm so glad you've been able to share these ideas with um, with us today. Um, I think um, just seeing the idea, and you and I've talked about this before about the possibilities, and that we we not get stuck in you know the futuristic. That it it is a, a world of possibilities and. Um, Today, but the team here know I'm a bit of a, <clears throat> a Star Trek person. And so I was all excited today when I saw um, the oldest person going into space at the age of 90 and a person who played a part in, in us looking toward the future for better systems and better technology. Um, and so I, I'm thankful for you for sharing your wisdom on how we continue to look forward for better systems and better technology. Um, I think we need to look at what might seem futuristic, but really change our thinking to see what is possible. And thanks, John, I really appreciate your time for doing that. It is a real pleasure to have you with us today. Well, thanks very much, Sherry. It's fun uh, trying to put these things together because it makes me think too. Yeah, I, I know your connection with Capital Care and Capital Care Foundation runs deep and you truly want to see the foundation, um, want to see that as in the um, the past year, um, just want to see us change how we think about things and, and really focus on what on supporting the things that can make things the best that they can be. So thank you for, for challenging us. I really, um, I think that gives us good guidance. You know, this past year has um, had us having to refocus our efforts to assist in a lot of different areas. Uh, we really had to be creative in the last couple of years, changing our support for the current need and helping our residents and staff just get through the days. Um, and all of these donors and, um, and supporters of Capital Care Foundation have helped us really um, to deal with what was right in front of us. Um, things like bringing in specialized activity kits for residents who are living in the isolation zones or tech devices for virtual visits, um, supporting our frontline staff with hot meals for those working in the isolation zones or, or gratitude efforts to keep the staff's energy up when exhaustion wanted to take over. And once again, reimagining events for both virtual and hybrid. It's been an interesting time, but it is really a time for us to change and move forward and rethink things. Um, I, I think before, before I get to the conclusion of today, I want to uh, give a bit of a commercial plug for this week is our gratitude week. And as part, it is the reason that we do this event virtually and bring people like John forward, um, to us. Um, we, we want to share with you, not only that we have been thanking our donors, our sponsors, our partners but that we are also trying to show thanks for our seniors who are really our focus. And we do have our gratitude. This is a, my commercial plug in case you're not sure what I'm going for here, but uh, we do wanna just make, remind people that uh, we do have our gratitude for seniors online auction and you're, you, we encourage you to take a look. There's always something for someone on there. Um, <clears throat> as we come to the conclusion of today though, and my, my deepest thanks to you, John, for, for sharing with us. I really, I, I like everyone, I'm eager to look towards a better future and one that keeps wellness and healing at the forefront. We believe in celebrating our successes and supporting change to better our seniors and residents' worlds. Uh, thank you for all for being part of our successes, helping our projects become realities 
And thank you for standing beside us as we continue to raise the bar. You make our future a reality and I really appreciate everyone who's here today and all of your support that you've given. So thank you all. I hope you've enjoyed the day and huge thanks to John McDougall for being a part of our, our uh, lunch hour here. So thank you.